Welcome to another IV Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is 5.1, Introduction to Soil Systems. The first big idea is that soils are systems. This is an ESS class, so you've got to approach soils as a system with inputs, outputs, storages, and flows. The soil system can be illustrated by a soil profile, which has a layered structure. You can see those here on the screen. The top layer is the O horizon, and one of the most important characteristics of the O horizon is that it has a lot of nutrients in it. It has lots of decayed organic material called humus in it. This is where a tremendous amount of growth in soils takes place. The next horizon is the A horizon, which is where you get aggregation of more mineral content mixing in very nicely with a lot of those nutrients. As you go deeper into the soils, from the O horizon down through the A, B, C, and R horizons, the ratio of organic matter to mineral content shifts from a high organic matter content in the O horizon to predominantly bedrock in the R horizon. That parent bedrock is what determines the mineral content of your soils. You'll notice in this graph that the bulk of what's in soils are the abiotic components, the mineral particles, the air, and the water and that only a small proportion comes from living organisms or from dead or decaying organic matter. You don't need to know these percentages, just know that the bulk of soils is made up of minerals, air, and water. There's two main transfers within soils, the first of which is called biological mixing. This is where the organisms that live in those top layers of soil literally churn and move around a lot of the materials that are in soil. So you have things like earthworms, or other invertebrates that are tunneling through the soils. You might have organisms such as moles or other rodents who again are burrowing into the soils. And as they burrow, they move things around without changing the state of matter. That's why it's a transfer. Another big transfer in soils is the downward movement of minerals that follows water as water percolates from the soil surface down into those deeper layers. This is called leaching which is the downward loss of nutrients from those top layers, their movement or transfer into lower horizons of the soils. If they go low enough, then plant roots can't access them and they have been lost to living organisms above. This system's diagram shows different inputs of organic material, including leaf litter, that's all the leaves that fall onto the, onto the surface of the ground from plants that live in that area. You also get the parent material, that's the bedrock down there in the R horizon of your soils. And as that parent material is slowly eroded or weathered over millennia, it contributes to smaller and smaller bits of rock that are in the soil and make up that mineral content. You also have precipitation, so rain, snow, sleet, any of that water that falls out of the atmosphere as it moves downward through the soil, that's an input of water, so that's precipitation. You also have an input of energy into the soils because soils will absorb sunlight when they're exposed to direct light. They'll warm up. They will gain energy that way. They also gain a lot of chemical energy in the form of the biomass that is dropped into the soils as that leaf litter. Outputs of matter in soil are uptake of water and nutrients via plant roots. You'll also have outputs of different matter in soils due to soil erosion. So in the soil itself, particles of soil itself leave the system due to rapid movement of water or wind, that's soil erosion, that's an output of matter from soils. Transformations in soil, the big ones here are decomposition, weathering, and nutrient cycling. Decomposition is simply the breaking down of organic matter from living organisms into smaller and simpler chemical compounds. Weathering is the very slow breakdown of, in particular, the parent rock, which are large pieces of rock into much smaller pieces of rock, eventually getting as small as sand, silt, and clay. The third big transformation in soils are nutrient cycles. The ones that you really should know are nitrogen and carbon cycles. The carbon cycle obviously has a connection with photosynthesis and respiration that happens. A lot of that is going on in the atmosphere. As that carbon that's been fixed into plant biomass is then returned into the soil, it gets broken down through decomposition into simpler compounds and is available for uptake again. You should definitely know parts of the nitrogen cycle as example of transformations within soil. You want to know that there are bacteria that live in close conjunction and cooperation with different plants, particularly your leguminous plants, and that those bacteria are responsible for what a process called nitrogen fixation, where they actually break down that diatomic nitrogen from the atmosphere, that N2, and they 
change it or transform it into a form called nitrates or NO3. The other big idea in this topic is that the quality of the soil influences the productivity of an area. There are three main soil particles you need to know about, sand, silt, and clay. And as you see here on the screen, sand is the largest particle, silt is a smaller particle, and clay is represented by a single pixel on the screen. The size differences in these particles is significant because it determines how closely they fit together. Coarse sand, the biggest sand particles, leave a lot of gaps between them. They don't stack together the way that bricks do in a wall. Whereas clay particles are so small, they fit very, very tightly together and they leave very little pore space between them. That pore space is critically important to the structure of soils because it's where the water and the air exist. An important tool for discussing the texture and structure of soils is a soil texture triangle. And all this does is it shows you the ratio of sand, silt, and clay in a given soil sample. And you read it just like you would read an XY coordinate grid in mathematics, except there are three grids here. Sand is across the bottom. And as you see the tilt of the numbers along that X axis, that's the angle at which you're going to follow those lines for sand. Clay, up the left side of it, you'll notice that those numbers are perfectly horizontal. And so the horizontal lines in the middle of the triangle represent the percentage of clay in the sample. And then similarly, silt is found along the right side. So if you look at the red dot in the bottom right corner of the screen, you can see that this sample, if you follow the line down to the bottom right, shows that it's 20% sand. You go to the left, it's 20% clay, and then you go up to the right, and it tells you that it's 60% silt. That's how you read a soil triangle. So what are the percentages that you see of the sand, silt, and clay where that blue dot is in the bottom center in that loam part of soil? If you came up with 40% sand, 35% silt, and 25% clay, you understand how to read a soil triangle. Remember that the name of this topic is soil systems, and this is an environmental systems and societies class. So you've got to picture soils as systems and you have to treat soils as systems. So on your exam, you may be asked to outline the transfers, the transformations, the inputs, the outputs, the flows, and the storages within soil systems. So you're going to have to think about all of the water that's entering the soil from precipitation and the way that water percolates downwards due to gravity and moves through the soil. That's a transfer. You need to remember that when that water is moving, it is carrying nutrients with it. So you'll get downward leaching of nutrients. So that's another transfer or flow of nutrients. It may be an output from top layers of soil into inputs into bottom layers of soil. You'll also have inputs of nutrients into the soil through the processes of decomposition. You'll have outputs of nutrients from the soil. When plants take them up, we call that uptake through the roots. So when you are discussing soils on your ESS exam, be sure to frame it all in terms of inputs, outputs, flows, and storages, because it is a system. If you're challenged to explain how soil can be viewed as an ecosystem, remember that it has both abiotic and biotic components. Abiotic components of soil come from the mineral content that results from the weathering of the parent bedrock down there in the R horizon at the bottom of the soil profile. Other abiotic components in the soils are the air and the water that are found in those pore spaces or those gaps between the soil particles. The biotic components of soil ecosystem are all of the organisms that live within the soils. Some of those may be fungi, some will be invertebrates, You'll have a bunch of bacteria, but you also might have some more complex organisms like vertebrates, such as rodents, rabbits, moles, that burrow through the soil. Those organisms contribute to what we call the biological mixing, where they churn the soil, they mix up the soil particles, the sand, the silt, and the clay, and they blend it with all of the organic matter. You should be able to compare and contrast the structure and property of soils based on their texture, based on the ratios of the sand, silt, and clay. Sand being the largest particles with the largest gaps between it tends to drain well. It tends to aerate quite well, meaning it allows more air into it. Clay with too much clay because the particles are so small and they pack so tightly together. They inhibit drainage and they hold water, so they tend to get waterlogged. That's why we use clay to make like ceramics and pots because it holds water, it becomes impervious. Silt is a nice blend. It's big enough that there is some air space in between the particles and some water space between the particles, but it's not so big that it drains really quickly and dries out too fast for plants to grow. Ideally, what you want is a soil that has a blend of all three of these. You want sand in there to promote drainage 
drainage and facilitate root growth. You want silt to be able to hang on to water and nutrients long enough to make them available for plants to grow. And you also want a little bit of clay in there to make sure that the water doesn't move vertically downward through the soil so fast that you end up having a bunch of nutrients leached out. You may be given a soil texture triangle and given a couple of different samples on that texture triangle and asked to compare and contrast soils from different places. You need to refer to the sand, silt, and clay content and discuss the characteristics of each of those particles and their influence on how the soils operate. That's it for topic 5.1 soil systems. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel. You can also find more materials for ESS over at my website, www.mrcreamerscience.com. Thanks for watching and happy learning.